Who has the slowest epigenetic pace of aging? That's what the Rejuvenation Olympics aims to find out, with the top 15 for its leaderboard shown here. Now, the Rejuvenation Olympics is based on the Dunedin Pace test, which then raises the question, how good is Dunedin Pace? Dunedin Pace is as good as the best epigenetic clocks for its association with all-cause mortality risk, and that's what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got the mortality effect size, HR, which is the hazard ratio. In other words, risk of death for all causes or all-cause mortality risk. And then on the x-axis, we've got six gold standard epigenetic clocks. Dunedin Pace, an earlier iteration of Dunedin Pace, Dunedin Pace of Aging Methylation, P-O-A-M, Horvath, Hanum, Phenoage, and note that this isn't the Phenoage test that includes albumin, alkaline phosphatase, white blood cells. This is the epigenetic test that corresponds to Phenoage, different test. And then also Grimage. And these six epigenetic clocks were evaluated for, uh, against all-cause mortality risk in two different studies, the normative aging study and Framingham offspring. So in terms of what was significant, we put up a red line at a hazard ratio of one. And remember where the vertical line above and below each of the circles is completely above that red line, we have a significant association. So that's true for Dunedin Pace in both studies. And the earlier iteration of Dunedin Pace also both was associated, was, was also associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk in both studies. In contrast, well, actually not in contrast, before I get to the Horvath and Hanum data, we can also see that that's true for phenoage and grimage. And all, in other words, an older phenoage and an older grimage were significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And for Dunedin Pace, a faster epigenetic pace of aging was associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. Now, for the epigenetic clocks that were not associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, for the normative aging study that was Horvath and Hanum, we can see that the vertical lines above and below the circles completely overlap with one in the normative aging study, so not, not significant. And note that Horvath is the best clock, epigenetic clock, for predicting chronological age, but as we can see here, it's not amongst the best for its association with all-cause mortality risk. And then in Framingham offspring, we can see that Horvath is once again not associated with all-cause mortality risk, whereas Hanum is, as both the vertical lines above and below that circle are above the hazard ratio of one. So from, this, from these data, we can see that Dunedin Pace is as good as the best epigenetic clocks for its association with all-cause mortality risk. But where this test really shines is that it's the only clock to identify a slower epigenetic pace of aging for people that were calorie restricted by 12% in a two-year study. And that's what we'll see here in these five images. On the y-axis, we've got the epigenetic change from baseline for the Horvath, Hanum, Phenoage, Grimage, and Dunedin Pace epigenetic clocks. And then there were two dietary groups, ad lib, and then again, this is a human study. So people that were uh, ate as much as they wanted whenever they wanted, that's ad lib, AL. And then the calorie restricted group, which ate 12% fewer calories over the course of the two-year study. And then we've got three time points where epigenetic age was assessed, or the epigenetic pace of aging was assessed. Baseline, 12 and 24 months on the ad lib or CR diet. So first, for both Horvath and Hanum at both time points, there was no significant difference for epigenetic age for the ad lib versus CR group. And then similarly, for phenoage and grimage, three of the four uh, time points were not significantly different. And then you may notice that that red triangle looks different for phenoage, but that's not, it wasn't significantly different from the uh, blue circles. In other words, and actually that data looks like it's going in the wrong direction where people who were on CR for two years would have an older, that would be the trend for an older uh, epigenetic age as measured by phenoage. Nonetheless, it wasn't significant, so we can't conclude anything about epigenetic age using phenoage comparing people on CR versus ad lib. In contrast, when looking at Dunedin Pace, people on the ad lib diet had an increased epigenetic pace of aging over those two time points, whereas people on CR, 12% CR for that two-year period, had a reduced epigenetic pace of aging, and those differences were significant. So from these data, we can see that Dunedin, Dunedin Pace is the only clock to identify a slower epigenetic pace of aging for people that were on a 12% calorie-restricted diet for two years. 
All right, so one of the main focuses of this channel is to optimize biomarkers of as many organ systems as possible. And epigenetics at the molecular level, that's one of the tiers which I'm with, uh, trying to improve. It's not just cells, proteins, uh, and other markers. So with that in mind, what's my data? So to address that, I sent blood to True Diagnostic. And if you want to measure your own, your own epigenetic age, including Dardena Pace, discount link in the video's description. So for the most recent test, this was for a March 20, uh, 4th, 2024. This is test number two in 2024. Results just came in about last week. So here we are with the video. So for that test in March, Dunedin pace was 0.82. So what does that mean? So the slowest epigenetic aging rate using this test is 0.6 as shown in green, whereas the fastest epigenetic aging rate is 1.4. So 0.82 is on the right side of that odometer. Now, we can put this into context a different way, too, by looking at how Dunedin pace changes during aging. And that's what's shown here, with Dunedin pace values on the y-axis plotted against chronological age. And then my data is that orange dot. And we can see that it's slower than average, average it's slower than the average Dunedin pace based on my chronological age. So the blue line would be the trend line for how the uh, Dunedin pace changes during aging. And we can see that the orange dot is below that. Now that blue line is also significant because it indicates that Dunedin pace increases during aging. In other words, it's harder to maintain a relatively younger Dunedin pace, somewhere around 0.6, as chronological age advances. So with, with that in mind, my goal isn't just to get from 0.8 to 0.6, it's to keep it as youthful as possible for as long as possible. Now, as I mentioned in many videos, this is just one test. It's important to not get too excited or too down for just one te test. What matters are year-to-year -year changes. So with that in mind, for more context, let's have a look at all tests since 2022. And that's what we can see here. I have 13 tests from 2022 to 2024. On the y-axis, we've got Dunedin pace values. And then for three tests in 2022, average Dunedin pace was 0.84. Over eight tests in 2023, average was 0.80. So good news, knowing that the need of pace increases during aging. But it's important to note that three tests in 2022 may not be representative of a full year, a full year's worth of data. Whereas eight tests in 2023, probably closer to the truth in terms of what my full year average uh, was around. All right, so when considering 2023 data, what about 2024? So after those first two tests, my average Dunedin pace is 0.81, around in the same ballpark of where it was in 2023 so far. Obviously, the goal is to improve it. So remember that to get onto the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard, they want the most recent three test average within the past six months. So with that in mind, my average is 0.785. So where would that rank on the leaderboard? And it would put me into a tie for 11th. They haven't updated the list in a while, but it would put me into a tie for 11th place. But the rules to get on the leaderboard are a little bit screwy. You can see it says the mean or average of the need and pace across six plus months. So I don't just have three tests in the past six months. I have five tests. And my average over those five tests in the past six months is 0.8787, which would put me into 12th place. So no matter how you cut it, I should be on the leaderboard when a new update uh, comes in, whenever they post that update. All right, but the goal isn't just to stay around 0.79 or so. It's to move up and not for the ego trip of saying, I, I'm, I have the lowest epigenetic pace of aging. I couldn't care less about that. What I care about is getting to my slowest epigenetic pace of aging and keeping, the, keeping it there indefinitely. So with that in mind, how can I reduce the need and pace? So first, let's take a look at correlations for diet with Dunedin Pace. And for those who are new to the channel or unfamiliar, since 2015, I, I've weighed all my food. And those daily amounts go into a food tracking app known as Chronometer. And then I manually enter that data into a spreadsheet. And with that in mind, each blood test then has a corresponding average dietary intake. In other words, if there are 50 days in between blood tests, the average dietary intake for those 50 days then lines up with the latter test. So now every blood test, not just for Dunedin Pace, any biomarker that I'm measuring on that day has an average dietary intake. And then I can ca calculate correlations because I have up to 50 blood tests for many things and 13 for Dunedin Pace. I can ca calculate correlations for diet, including macro, micronutrients, and individual foods with biomarkers. 
And then with the goal of improving biomarkers, I follow as many of the significant with a p-value less than 0.05, I follow as many of those significant correlations as possible. And then after each test, I recalculate the correlations and then continue to follow the top correlations with the goal of improving biomarkers. It's a constant iterative process of following correlations, testing, seeing what the data shows with the goal of improvement. So for following this most recent test, the 13 tests for Dunedin and Pace, let's take a look at comparisons for foods, macro, and micronutrients. And I looked at 91 comparisons on that list, foods, macros, and micros, with the uh, top of the list shown here. Full correlations for all biomarkers are on the correlations tier on Patreon. So if you're interested in that, check it out. So for this table, we've got the food or nutrient on the left, the correlation in the middle, and then the p-value with less than 0.05 being significant. And what we can see is that none of these uh, foods or nutrients that are on the list have a p-value less than 0.05. So unfortunately, once again, following test number 13, I have no room, you know, no, no leads in terms of diet for optimizing or improving Dunedin Pace. So just like I did for the last video in this series, because I'm testing other biomarkers on the same day as Dunedin Pace, I get full chemistry panel, CBC, and all of that good stuff, metabolomics. So I can look at correlations for other biomarkers with Dunedin Pace to gain more insight. And if you saw the last video in this series, Dunedin Pace was significantly associated with LDL. In fact, an inverse correlation, as you can see there, with the correlation coefficient of minus 0.61. What that suggests is that within my range for LDL and Dunedin Pace, higher LDL is correlated with a slower epigenetic pace of aging. And conversely, when my LDL was lower, that was significantly correlated with a faster epigenetic pace of aging. Now note that my LDL range is 62 to 83 in this case. So I, I don't know if this extrapolates to people with far higher LDLs. I don't know if there's a U-shape to this or even if this is a real correlation. Time will tell with more testing. So this was for 11 tests. Now for test number 12, and remember one of the tests is missing. I mentioned I have 13 tests. Now I'm saying I have 12 tests because I have 12 tests for Dunedin Pace on the same day as biomarkers where I have 13 total tests for Dunedin Pace. So I can only look at uh, co-correlations co for LDL and other biomarkers with Dunedin Pace. So prior to the test after this for the March 4th test, the goal was to increase LDL by increasing saturated fatty acid intake with coconut butter. And why saturated fatty acids and why coconut butter? As I mentioned in the previous video in this series, that's one of the most, uh, that's one of the strongest correlations for higher LDL in my data. And again, those correlations are on the correlations tier on Patreon. So then the obvious question is, did I actually increase saturated fatty acid intake or uh, actually coconut butter as a means for increasing LDL. Because if I'm just going to wing it and say, yeah, I kind of ate more, I think I ate more, maybe I didn't. So by tracking, I can actually answer that question. So for three weeks prior to the March test and the test before that, January 15th, coconut butter intake for that 21-day period was 26 days for the most recent test, where it was only 16 grams per day for that January test. So in other words, I increased coconut butter and I used the two sample t-test to confirm that or to evaluate that. You can see that its p-value is less than 0.05. In other words, I significantly increased coconut butter intake prior to the March test relative to the January test. So then that raises the question, did LDL increase? So we can see the, now we can see the 12 test correlation. This is the most recent data after the March 4th test. And to address the question, did LDL increase? We can see that it was 82 uh, milligrams per deciliter, so towards the high end of my range. But the goal was to get it even higher. It was to get me outside of my normal range within this uh, 12 test range. I wanted to push it to 85, 90, or even a little bit higher to really evaluate this correlation for LDL with Dunedin Pace. So to answer the question, did LDL increase? It didn't. So then that raises the question, should I even be pursuing this uh, hypothesis? And to address that question is, is the LDL Dunedin Pace correlation still significant? Because if it isn't, I'm gonna to have to try to come up with a different way to try to optimize Dunedin Pace. So as we can see with the p-value and the correlation coefficient still being negative, negative 0.57, it's right at that border of statistical significance still, 0.05. So the answer is yes, this correlation is still significant. I'm still gonna continue to pursue a higher LDL to see if I can reduce Dunedin Pace. 
to see if correlation may indeed equal causation. I don't presume that it is, but we've got to do the experiment to find out. So for test number 13 with, uh, actually it's test number 14, but test number 13 where I'll have biomarkers with the and pace for the next test, the goal is to increase not just saturated fatty acid intake with coconut butter, but also adding uh, more cholesterol into my diet, in this case from eggs. Because in looking at the correlations for LDL with my diet, higher LDL via diet, it's not just saturated fatty acids that are at the top of my list. Cholesterol is right under there too. So the combination of saturated fatty acids from coconut butter and adding more cholesterol into my diet may push LDL a bit higher. So I've added eggs back in, five eggs per week for now. And sure, I could go much higher for that, but remember, I'm not trying to blow up the system. I'm trying to make very small changes with the goal of improving Dunedin pace without messing anything else up. And then if I'm able to push LDL out to 85, 90, and maybe even a little bit higher, will I see consistently see Dunedin paces in the low 0.7 range, 0.73 or somewhere there, around there? To find out, the next test is scheduled for April 29th of 2024. So stay tuned for that data coming probably sometime in early June. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links that you may be interested in, including discount links for epigenetic testing or microbiome composition, NAD quantification, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with SciFox Health, which includes ApoB and now GrimAge, green tea, dye tracking with chronometer, which I mentioned earlier, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Dye Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. Hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.